Hello, welcome to Philosophy Roulette, where I read and review philosophy papers live on the internets. So, here we are on the Phil Papers webpage, and let's see what's new. Please feel free to stop by, come by, see what is going on live. Of course, if you're watching on the YouTube, that's cool too. Let's well, classical quarterly. All right, I'm going to read about the classics, but. Hmm. Blood flow in Aristotle. Well, there we go. I mean, I'm not just doing classics here because, well, I would like some more philosophical content. That doesn't really mean there won't be any in these things, but it's just hard to know. I just want to know what blood flow in Aristotle would be about. That kind of cool. So, I mean, are we going to get like a different sort of medical view of blood? Are we getting the humor blood? Um, are we getting like the something else uh lens of circulation but since the 19th century to prove the ancient author in fact so preempted harvard's circulation with empathetic embarrassment huh interesting all right well unfortunately that seems more medical history and but it would still be very cool the history of medicine is a fascinating topic i read a book on this thing called, uh, was it Humors or something by Noga Arika? Something on, uh, Humors and on the Humors or whatever. Fascinating look at the history of, uh, humor theory and medicine. So I recommend that book if you guys want to read about that. Cognition. Unfortunately, I don't do cognition stuff because a lot of times it's too much science content. And I can't read, uh, Reading out tables is extremely difficult. It's one of those, like, 2, comma, 3, comma, 8, comma, no, not happening. But also feel free to make suggestions. I just did a bunch of suggestions. I got some more suggestions I'm going to get to um, in the future. Complexity also. Cognition and emotion. Um, reduced shared emotional representations toward women revealing more skin. See, experimental research is hard to uh, talk about. In real time, you have to like look at the thing. Same with complexity. Oh dear, so we've had a lot of science content come out in the last few days. That's cool, but... Alright, so here we go. Conferro, Essays on Education, Philosophy, Politics. I don't know this show. Let's give it a click. Criminal Law. We just did one of the uh, Criminal Law and Philosophy not that long ago. Episteme and Educational Philosophy and Theory. Alright, so let's look at these journals. Urquentness. Also a good journal. All right, so on second page seems to be a bit more uh, philosophy heavy. The economic problem of masochism in education. What? Uh, 2018. Oh, let's go look at the new stuff. I want, oh, there's nothing. Oh, this is so something just got uploaded from 2018, but it doesn't look like they're publishing at the moment. Was is this a uh, open access journal? Can I just read the papers? Let's find out. It might be. Interesting. But it's 30 pages. No, thank you. Yeah, if there's no page numbers here, let's... Ooh. Let me just get my page number search thing going. Editorial. And one of two. What's the other one, then? An essay. Resentment, disappointment, and the ceaseless vitality of teachers and pedagogy. Von Richt. Moira Von Richt. Or Von Wright. Interesting. Let's take a quick look. Hmm. Uh, Stockholm. So it might be a, uh, a von Richt. Interesting. Uh, yes. So let's see what's criminal law and philosophy we have for us today. And forthcoming. So we've got a review. Extending limits of blame. Oh, I think I've seen some of these. Well, we could like take a look at extending limits. The limits of blame, review, reply, a uh, reply. I don't know what that. Can oh, yeah, comments on. Um, yeah, so six pages. Can the law do without retributivism? The limits of blame. Okay. Huh. All right. So let's take a look at like what we have so far. The limits of blame. Okay. Extending this. So oh, so this is uh, this was a. Uh, 
what's it called? So it must have been a, a focused ep, uh, edition, but I don't have access to these things, and that makes reading the papers hard if it's behind a paywall. All right, educate. Let's see what we got. All right, so all of these are kind of short. Looks like. Well, this is not. This is uh, eleven pages. All right, so we've got a bunch of stuff here in educational theory. Let's see what else we've got in episteme. I do like some epistemology. Haven't read any epistemology in a while, so um, might do something like that. So we've got a nice old. We got a pa paper right here. Let's see what else we got. Problem of unwelcome. Oh, and this is the last paper we read. Okay, so basically I've seen everything before there. Uh, doesn't mean I've read everything. In pursuit of the non-trivial. Actually, that sounds good too. Imagination cannot justify empirical belief. I think I've read this a while back. Okay, so let's just see. Epistemic consequentialists. What does that mean? Interesting. <coughs> if anyone wants to vote, uh, please tell me what they have a preference about. Please tell me if uh, you're going to say hi in the chat if you wish. Let's see what Urkentness has. Um, hmm. I think I've read this a long time ago. Why is this, uh... It's forthcoming, but these are 2019 papers, so maybe this is a, a little bit of a busted, uh... Search. I don't know. Okay, but I don't think I, uh, read any, most of these either, so... Okay, we can take a look. Search down on the Urkentness. Approaching truth in conceptual spaces. What's a conceptual space? I don't know. It seems like a very, very big page. I don't know if you can really see this little itsy uh, slider bar, but they get very small. Yeah, I read this paper. When, like, there's a huge amount that it goes down, so. Powerful problems for powerful qualities. Hmm, very powerful. Stallnacker, Semantics for McGee. I think I've yeah, seen most of these. Luck and Modality. Okay, so... Let's not do that. I'm leaning towards the uh, epistemic paper, the episteme paper on epistemics, but and there's no page numbers on the European Journal for Philosophy of Science, and that makes me sad. Let's go back to 2020. See what we got here. There are page numbers here, but there are none of them was found, so everything is too long in the European Journal for Philosophy of Science. So, are there any epistemic consequentialists? This sounds like, I don't know if it's fun for you, but it might be fun for me. Let's see if it's actually available first before getting all excited. 1 to 20 in double spaced. I like this, and so we'll give it a, a shot. Hmm, looks like they updated their graphics in the Firefox. It's not quite prepared for that. But this seems to hit a few spots epistemology and consequentialism so hey that's kind of fun alrighty so if you are in chat you can grab the link right there if you come late and you want to grab the paper you type exclamation point paper in the chat and it will pop back up Beautiful. So, if anyone joins me live, feel free to comment along the way. I'm just going through it the first time myself, so... I'm going to find out what's here. Um, and I apologize for how I say any non-English names. Or, I apologize for everything I say, basically. But Sung Sing Ho, I'm going to go with for now. Okay. Salim Berker, along with others recently revives the interest in the problems concerning epistemic consequentialism originally posed by Robert Firth. He argues that epistemic consequentialism is structurally flawed. This is supposed to be deeply worrying because Barker, Berker observes that consequentialism is pervasive in epistemology as he comments. One naturally expects that just as in ethics literature where a wide variety of teleological theories are defended by a wide vari variety 
are defended and a wide variety of non-teleological theories are defended, so too the epistemology literature should be populated by a wide variety of both teleological and non-teleological theories. But what one finds when one turns to epistemology literature is, as it, it exists today is quite surprising, for a teleological approach to normative epistemology is overwhelmingly the dominant view. Um... I mean, as a sociological point, I, I think he's right. I don't know. There are definitely some virtue epistemologists that basically say you have like uh, knowledge-based virtues, and therefore you can have like once you like cultivate the proper knowing the epistemic habits, then you have a better like flourishing epistemology. And so it's a Aristotelian sort of based theory of that and that would be definitely non-teleological it'd be some sort of virtue based not a uh, telos not a formal thing I agree with Berker that epistemic consequentialism is structurally flawed and if Berker is right that epistemic consequentialism is pervasive then epistemology is in deep trouble fortunately he's wrong about the last point I will argue that most of the card carrying consequentialists picked out by Berker are better to be considered non-consequentialists there are indeed self-claimed epistemic consequentialists but if I am right I suspect that they are probably mistaken about their own views they are better to be interpreted as what I call epistemic instrumentalists this is always a very dangerous tack um, saying that people are mistaken about their own views um, that is something you can do, but it's an interesting argument saying, look, these people are, they don't know what they're talking about when it comes to themselves. That's kind of hard because people tend to get insulted about that sort of thing. So continuing in section one and two, respectively, I explain what I mean by epistemic consequentialism and epistemic instrumentalism. Both views maintain that epistemic justification is a means for achieving the epistemic goals, but one crucial difference separates them. Supposing that truth is the sole epistemic goal, epistemic consequentialism maintains that truth conduciveness is the necessary and sufficient condition for epistemic justification, whereas epistemic instrumentalism maintains that truth condu conduciveness is merely a necessary condition. So the difference here is the sufficiency condition here. Um, okay. This clarifies the structural problem of epistemic consequentialism Berker tries to identify. That is, the problem of epistemic consequentialism is caused by the claim that truth conduciveness alone is sufficient for justification. Accordingly, epistemic instrumentalism can avoid the consequentialist problem. In section 3, I argue that most consequentialists Berker identifies are better to be considered instrumentalists. Thus, consequentialism is not pervasive in epistemology. Okay, so basically... This is a terminology issue. You could like switch around uh, which one is a consequentialist and which one is some other term if you want. Um, according to this author, it's better to do it this way where they are arguing that the term that the people are using is probably not accurate and they want to use instrumentalism instead. But basically, it's, it's coming down to how this uh, their claim is actually shaking out. So the terms don't really matter. To be clear, I do not intend to defend epistemic instrumentalism as a viable theory of epistemic justification, though I do argue that it can avoid the structural problem of consequentialism. Rather, I want to discredit the claim that epistemic consequentialism is pervasive. If few of the consequentialists are genuinely consequentialists, then the fact that epistemic consequentialism is structurally flawed is not worrying. Recently, some commentators argued that the analogy between ethical and epistemic consequentialism is misplaced, and therefore Berker cannot pose similar counterexamples from ethics to epistemic consequentialism. While our views seem similar, they focus more on the disanalogy and do not explain why several epistemologists misunderstand themselves as consequentialists because epistemic consequentialism and instrumentalism are easily confused. I offer a diagnosis of their confusion, which would be helpful for future discussion about epistemic teleology. Again, dangerous um, argumentation here. I mean, not necessarily incorrect, just dangerous because of the uh, telling people that what they say is wrong is just dangerous. But that's okay. I mean, as long as the distinctions are good, it's fine. But just the argumentation style here is kind of interesting. Um, it's like, all right, you have to fix your terms up and then we'll get things right. But people don't like being told... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> that they've got they, that everyone is using the terms wrong. I mean, the words matter, in, especially in everywhere, of course, but especially in philosophy. If you're going to name something, it's going to have a history, it's going to have baggage, it's going to have all sorts of uh, associated concepts with it. And so people like to take on the names and specific terms for those reasons. It's a strategic move to call something consequentialism. You're trying to, you know, inherit the uh, rich history of consequentialism. And so when you try to take that away from people um that's kind of taking away that sort of the cachet of having the rich history of consequentialism because it's one of the major theories out there so um this is why it's a danger i just want to explain why i'm saying it's dangerous it's not because there's anything like inherently good or bad i'm saying it's just that there's a sociological uh cachet to these big theories and that's and people want that they want to get um some sort of the glamour of being the, if that can be associated with a philosophy they want the glamour of that theory uh, section one epistemic consequentialism and its structural problem as Berker 2013 AB analyzes all forms of consequentialism, with the exception of scalar consequentialism which discards deontic properties, consists of three components. One a theory of final value that specifies what final values are. Two, a theory of overall value that explains how to assess and rank the overall values of a certain entity by measuring how they conduce toward final values. And three, a deontic theory that determines the deontic problems of objects, excuse me, being right, justified, or permissible based on the theory of overall value. The theory of final value is thus the most fundamental one. Um... The theory of final value. So yeah, this is why you're a consequentialist. One of the most popular theories of epistemic final value is veritism. I never heard this before, but it's interesting. Which maintains that truth is the sole epistemic final value. In the following discussion, I will focus exclusively on veritist epistemic consequentialism, though nothing of what I will argue is uh, affected by this assumption. Okay, so we've got a... Um, I guess it would be something to keep in mind veritism which maintains that truth is the sole epistemic final value um i have absolutely no idea what truth is i mean i hope someone out there does i kind of doubt that they do but the question of course is if it's a sole epistemic final value how do we even know what it is especially if that's what we're aiming at <laughs> then how what are we measuring this is one of my problems not uh the uh literature is fine but if this is what we're aiming at, then how do we actually measure it against what? Because we're trying to get there. And so it looks like we're trying to measure what we are trying to achieve by our achieving it. So it seems a little circular to do this. But anyway, continuing. Under the, con under the consequentialist framework, deontic properties have only instrumental value because their values are determined solely by the overall final value to which they conduce. As Berker explains, non-fundamental non-final value is explicable in terms of conduciveness towards fundamental final value, and deontic notions such as obligation, permission, and righteous rightness must obtain in virtue of facts about value. Based on Berker's account, therefore, epistemic consequentialism is committed to the following thesis. Instrumental value. Epistemic justification is only instrumentally valuable for achieving the truth goal. But if epistemic consequentialism is committed to instrumental value, it must also accept the following thesis. Truth conduciveness. Truth conduciveness is necessary and sufficient for epistemic justification. <coughs> Under the consequentialist framework, instrumental value and truth conduciveness are two sides of the same coin. Since justification is measured only by its instrumental value, relative to truth, whatever has enough instrumental value can thus provide justification. Yeah. Truth conduciveness, it follows, is sufficient and necessary for epistemic justification. Thus, Berker commit comments on reliabilism, which he regards as a paradigm of epistemic co consequentialism, that a more perspicuous name for reliabilism is truth conduciveness. Truth conducivism. <laughs> Please, anyone out there, ask, feel free to ask questions. Say hi. If you have any uh, comments on this, let me know. Uh, this is kind of fun in, ter in, in terms of some of these uh, terms I haven't seen before. Given instrumental value and truth conduciveness, we can identify the structural problem of epistemic consequentialism. 
epistemic consequentialism. Berker notes that initially he thought that epistemic consequentialism is wrong because they ignore separateness of propositions, which allows problematic trade-offs. But he later recognizes that there is a deeper structural problem, though he says, I am still struggling to figure out the best way to characterize this more general structural, structural feature. I would like to suggest that the structural problem caused by caused exactly by instrumental value and truth conduciveness. Uh, that I would like to suggest that the structural problem caused exactly by instrumental and truth conditions is something or what? I feel like this sentence is funky. Anywho, in fact, Berker has already indicated that for Firth, consequentialism is untenable because it attempts to analyze intrinsic epistemic merit for, of justification in terms of instru intrin instrumental epistemic merit. But Berker believes that his inference is too quick. I disagree. Firth view is spot on. Let's examine my diagnosis of some of Berker's counterexamples for epistemic consequentialism. Am I missing what exactly the structural problem is? The ignore the separateness of prop propositions. I don't quite understand what the problem is here. I don't understand this yet. Um, but he re rec li um, let's see this one. I don't quite know what the issue is here. I don't know the background. But he later recognizes there's a deeper struggle, though he says he's still trying to figure out what it is. I just don't know what this is. Like, it, I hope it's it's forthcoming. Okay, so let's just find out what this author has to say. Scientist. Suppose I'm a scientist seeking to get a grant from a from a religious organization. I realize that my only chance for, of receiving funding from the organization is to believe in the existence of God. Um, I very much doubt that. You could definitely lie about this, and as long as they believe you believe, then that's all that would probably be necessary, but I guess this is a very dedicated scientist. Finally, I know that were I to receive the grant, I would use it to further my research, which would allow me to, to form a large number of new tr true beliefs and to revise a large number of previously held false beliefs about a variety of matters of great intellectual significance. Would my belief in God belief that God exists be epistemically rational or reasonable or justified? Alright. Odd thing, I think, but whatever. Keep going. Second example, prime number. Suppose the following is true of me. Whenever I contemplate whether a given natural number is prime, I form a belief that it is not. Is 25 prime? No, it is not. Is 604 prime? No, it is not. Is 7 prime? No, it is not. Let's also stipulate that this is the only cognitive process by which I form beliefs about primeness of natural numbers. Since the ratio of prime to composite numbers is less than n less than n approaches zero as n approaches infinity, my belief forming process tends to yield a ratio of true to false beliefs that approach, approaches one. Therefore, pro the process reliable process reliabilists are forced to say that because my belief forming process is almost perfectly reliable, any belief formed on its basis is justified. But that's crazy. My account fits both examples. For epistemic consequentialism, my belief that God exists in in scientist, the scientist example, would be considered justified because it will cause many true beliefs and eliminate many false beliefs. In prime number, my belief that 7 is not prime is considered justified because it, it is produced by a highly reliable process. In both examples, truth conduciveness alone is sufficient for justification. Hence, my account does, does capture the structural problem in Berker's counterexamples. Okay, so this is kind of what it is, is that you've got... um. It seems like there is some sort of relevance uh, issue going on, that there's somehow, even though it's reliable, in some sense it's completely irrelevant to the knowledge that um, you're supposed to be talking about. So even though you're using a completely reliable process, and even though you believe in God because it's going to be helpful to get a grant which will be useful for other reasons, um, that it seems like there's some sort of disconnect between the process and the um the belief okay so we'll see so therefore instrumental value and truth conduciveness are the structural problems of consequentialists but Berker is wrong that the consequentialist problem is worrisome for epistemologists. True, many epistemologists talk as if they are consequentialists, but they do not really accept instrumental value or truth and truth conduciveness. They are what I call epistemic instrumentalists. In the next section, I introduce epistemic instrumentalism. 2. Epistemic instrumentalism 
Epistemic instrumentalism is a non-consequentialist twin of epistemic consequentialism. Likewise, epistemic instrumentalism holds the following theses. A plus is added to express the idea that instrumentalism maintains that epistemic justification has more than instrumental truth value, instrumental value and truth conduciveness. So we've got instrumental value plus. Epistemic justification is a means to the truth goal, which has epistemic final value. Okay, so we've, now we've got this means in here. Truth conduciveness plus. Truth conduciveness is necessary but not sufficient for epistemic justification. Epistemic instrumentalism is easily confused with consequentialism because both regard because both regard justification as a means to truth. Unlike consequentialism, however, epistemic instrumentalism holds that justification is epistemically finally valuable, which makes it worth pursuing for its own sake beyond the goal of truth. Since epistemic instrumentalism maintains that justification oh yeah. Since epistemic instrumentalism maintains that justification has value beyond its instrumental value relative to truth, it doesn't need to maintain that truth conduciveness is sufficient for justification. So because you've got some instrumental use, you can just do it for its instrumental good, but you're not only doing it for the truth. So there's something beyond or outside of truth that the instrumentalist likes. So it's not a truth-based, a, truth a, fun a, truth a fundamental uh, theory, something else also counts besides truth. One may question how justification being a means to truth can have value beyond instrumental value. Indeed, it appears that the value of epistemic justification lies solely in truth conduciveness and is thus derived from truth. That could explain why instrumental value looks so attractive. Since accepting instrumental value leads one to commit to truth conduciveness, let me explain how instrumental value could be resisted. Kurt Sylvan offers such an account. Sylvan, borrowing an insight from Thomas Herka, points out that if X is finally valuable and Y is a proper way of valuing X, the value of Y is derivative from X but is nevertheless finally valuable. For example, the love of truth derives this value from truth and is also finally valuable. Sylvan argues that since epistemic justification manifests a way of respecting truth, its value is final and derivative from truth. Therefore, even if one considers epistemic justification as a means to truth, it does not follow that one must accept instrumental value. And that's the non-plus version, just that only the truth-seeking is the only thing. So in some sense, I guess it's saying it's not only the destination, but also the journey that counts. So that's sort of what's going on here. So it's not just the truth you're getting to, it's how you get there matters. There is something in the method that uh, is, is valuable. As I've discussed under the consequentialist framework, deontic properties have only instrumental value. Deontic properties are excluded from the theory of final value and are determined by their conduciveness to final values alone. Since epistemic instrumentalism holds that epistemic justification has final value, it rejects the whole consequentialist framework. For instrumentalism, the right is something that worth pursuing for its own sake. But by... Excuse me. By rejecting instrumental value and the consequentialist framework, ep epistemic instrumentalism needn't commit itself to truth conduciveness. Instead, it can opt for truth conduciveness plus the thesis that truth conduciveness is necessary but not sufficient for epistemic justification. To be sure, those who accept instrumental value plus can still maintain that truth conduciveness is sufficient for justification. The point, however, is that they do not have to, unlike epistemic consequentialists. All right, so this is basically throwing in some sort of like deontic flavor into this uh, uh, consequentialist story. It's not just the ultimate value you get to, but it also matters that um, in some sense, like you have to do it like through the right way. Maybe it's not just deontological, maybe it's a, a little virtue -y. like you have to have the right method, like the right habits, or you have to um, in some sense have some sort of a mitigated theory that there is still like a high low like in that in consequentialism you got like you know what is it? the mill of course you've got the uh lower things like there's lower um uh values just the hedonistic theory and then you got the higher ones and so uh there's something like that is going on here that there's something else that is going on that you can sort of sort the uh the values 
By rejecting instrumental value and truth conduciveness, epistemic instrumentalism can avoid the structural problem of consequentialism caused by the thesis that truth conduciveness is sufficient for epistemic justification because epistemic instrumentalism regards truth conduciveness as merely a necessary condition. Let me give an example of epistemic in instrumentalism. Alvin Plantinga, who Berker wrongly considers a consequentialist. Really? Okay, here Plantinga's account of epistemic justification, though he uses the term warrant instead. A belief has warrant for me only if, one, it has been produced in me by a cognitive faculties that are working properly, functioning as they ought to, subject to no cognitive dysfunction, in a cognitive environment that is appropriate for my, kid, my kinds of cognitive faculties. Two, the segment of the design plan governing the production of that belief is aimed at the production of true beliefs. And three, there is a high statistical probability that a belief produced under those conditions will be true. Despite the condition three concerning truth conduciveness, Plantinga is not a consequentialist because truth conduciveness is only a necessary condition. The first two conditions offer non-consequentialist elements. A belief is justified only if it is produced by a suitable cognitive faculty, which must be truth conducive in ways proper to its function or design. These non-consequentialist conditions allow Plantinga to deal with Burkers. Counterexamples. Plantinga could argue that the religious belief in scientist and the belief forming process in prime number do not satisfy the first two conditions and thus they cannot provide justification. One may worry that the first conditions the first two conditions in Plantinga's theory might be consequentialist because what makes them conditions for justification is truth conduciveness. To make this objection work for sure, it should be the case that truth conduciveness alone is sufficient for a faculty or function to provide justification. If so, Plantinga could still be considered a consequentialist. While I agree that truth conduciveness remains an essential part of the first two conditions, it is not sufficient for the idea of proper function. Compare an example of proper function from Plantinga with prime number. When the coolant temperature of my car gets up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit, the thermostat should open. There are many ways to explain their difference, but the idea of sensitivity is useful here. The thermostat functions properly because it function because its function is sensitive to the temperature of the coolant. The thermostat would not open if the coolant is under 200 degrees Fahrenheit. However, the belief forming process in prime number is not sensitive because it is, even when a number is not a prime number, the process will still form a belief that it is a prime number. This is what I was saying about uh, relevance. This sort of a sensitivity condition here is kind of interesting. Um, it's somehow tying the process to the uh, truth that it somehow has to track it in a sensitive way and so there is some sort of method built into the processes here in these two first conditions here that produced by a cognitive process the cognitive faculties are working properly and they are tracking the world in some sense the examples above of scientist and um uh what's it called and uh prime number there is no tracking of the actual data and so this is some sort of the sensitivity condition is doing work there and it's what i was saying as i was saying earlier it's sorting the sort of um like beliefs that are like good like the ones that uh like the higher beliefs that are we're supposed to like get and then these like and sorting it from the lower ones where it's not sensitive it's not actually tracking anything um, it just happens to be relatively um, uh, reliable, but like it, it doesn't actually track anything. More importantly, while sensitivity does contribute to the truth conduciveness of the thermostat, it is not determined by truth conduciveness alone. One factor in sensitivity, I think, is causality. So this is the link, as I was just commenting. The mechanism of the thermostat is causally linked to the temperature of the coolant, which explains why its responsiveness to the coolant's temperature is reliable. However, what explains the reliability of the belief forming process in prime number is merely the fact that the overwhelming majority of numbers are not prime numbers. In other words, while the process in prime number could be much more reliable than the thermostat, the former does not, but the latter does, form their target beliefs in a proper way. See, I don't know if this is the right sort of way. proper way. Who knows what that is? Therefore, not any sort of truth conduciveness is sufficient for proper function. To be clear, my aim is not to offer a defense of epistemic instrumentalism, but merely to correct 
a grave self-misunderstanding among epistemologists. It is enough for my purpose to show that epistemic instrumentalism can avoid the structural problem of consequentialism, and most epistemic consequentialists are better interpreted as instrumentalists, which I argue in the next section. Again, this is the I find this uh, argumentation like they could turn the terms around maybe if they wanted. But I mean, if this argument is right, and it seems like, okay, if you can separate out this necessary and uh, sufficient condition, then it seems like they're, the author here has a good point. Even if like I disagree with how they're going about uh, naming things, terminology. So, con But we're going to get to what the author says. Consequentialists are instrumentalists. Given the similarity between epistemic consequentialism and instrumentalism, it is unsurprising that they could be e is unsurprising that they could e be easily confused. In a footnote, Berker names 35 epistemologists as consequentialists. They are consequentialists, according to Berker, mainly because they consider truth conduciveness as the hallmark of epistemic justification, or they consider justification a means to truth. For example, he considers Richard Foley a consequentialist just because Foley insists that epistemic rationality in particular is structured around the fundamental goal of now believing those propositions that are true and now not believing those prop propositions that are false. We now know that instrumentalism also has these features. To show that they are consequentialists, he needs to demonstrate that they do accept instrumental value and truth conduciveness. For example, and these are the non-plus, there's nothing outside of instrumental value and truth conduciveness. For example, Berker regards John Greco as a consequentialist, probably because Greco thinks that justified belief is adequate to her goal of believing the truth. But Greco's... But Greco... Greco... Greco requires. Greco requires. I say that a lot. But Greco... Yeah, I can't say but Greco requires. That might be a new tongue twister. But Greco requires a belief's dox doxastic justification is grounded in one's cognitive disposition one manifests when one is thinking conscientiously. Since Greco does not accept truth conduciveness, he is not a consequentialist. Yeah, because the conscientiously is valuing something outside of just the truth conduciveness. The same problem applies to other epistemologists in Perker's list, so I think there is no need to go through every one of them. I have argued that Plantinga is not a consequentialist. I will discuss three prominent epistemologists whom Burke identifies as consequentialists. William Alston, Lawrence Bonjour, and Alvin Goldman. I argue that Burker fails to demonstrate that they are consequentialists because either there is no evidence that they do accept instrumental value and truth conduciveness, or they do reject them. I also discuss the defense of process reliabilism by Christopher Alstrom V and Jeffrey Dunn, and argue that their defense in fact supports what reliable what that reliabilism is instrumentalist. <coughs> okay. So I mean we basically got the argument at this point, and we're gonna go through and show how this actually makes a difference. Which is kind of which is, which should be interesting. Um but yeah. All right, let's just continue and see what, where we're going, because I guess we're going to get a little bit different flavor among these different epistemologists, so we can see kind of how this is shaking out. So, like I said earlier, the structure of this paper is to, like, all right, we got a distinction, we show, like, a, necessary, a difference between necessary and sufficiency, and then showing that people who accept both are a little too constrained, and then... What I do like about this, as opposed to saying everyone's got their terminology wrong, the author is now going through and saying, well, everybody actually got it right. So this is sort of like, I think the author, in terms of the, their rhetoric here, they kind of messed up their sort of like line of attack saying, oh, you've all got your terminology wrong. But they got it right in saying, well, most people actually are not in the bad position. So... That's a good thing, because then people will be like, well, all right, fine, we'll change our terminology, which no one's going to do. No one ever changes their terminology. They don't like doing that. But what they'll do is they'll redefine it, and they'll call the other ones, like, the old style or whatever. But, um, yeah, and then the author is now arguing that even though the terminology is funky, they actually had the, the, the uh, concept right, and that's a good thing. Okay. 
Austin 05 urges us to dispense the monistic conception of epistemic justification with the pluralist conception of epistemic desiderata. Apparently, Austin rejects instrumental value because all epistemic desiderata are epistemically desirable for their own sake. However, Berger maintains that Alston is a consequentialist because, for Alston, all epistemic desiderata are ultimately defined in terms of how well they help us further the goals of cognition. It's true that Alston takes truth as the most fundamental epistemic goal, but he laboriously explains how each desideratum is connected to the truth goal. So he labor laboriously explains how each is connected to the truth goal. But notice that the goals of cognition are plural. Each epistemic desideratum is truly finally valuable from the epistemic point of view. So in terms, in the discussion of whether goals of cognition are Partly independent of any con connection with the goal of truth should count as epistemic dis desiderata, Alston comments. The question is whether we want to loosen up the requirements of epistemic desirability to include items the intrinsic desirability of which is over and above that of the true false balance, but which presupposes such a balance as a necessary condition of that desirability. In the absence of any sufficient reason for being hard-nosed on this issue, I will allow the realization of these cognitive goals to count as epistemic desiderata. When Alston tries to relate other desiderata to truth, he is not claiming that all those desiderata are only instrumentally valuable in relation to truth. Instead, he is trying to define why those desiderata are epistemic rather than moral or prudential. That's why he italicized epistemic in the above quotation. For Alston, the final value of an epistemic desideratum is not exhausted by truth or truth conducive alone. It does have epistemic final value over and above truth. Obviously, Alston rejects instrumental value, so he is not a consequentialist. Lawrence Bonjour In an oft-quoted passage, Bonjour apparently espouses epistemic consequentialism. What makes us con cognitive beings at all is our capacity for belief and the goal of our distinctively cognitive endeavors is truth. The basic role of justification is that of a means to truth. If epistemic justification were not conducive to truth in this way, if finding epistemically justified beliefs did not substantially increase the likelihood of finding true ones, then epistemic justification would be irrelevant to our main cognitive goal and of dubious worth. Epistemic justification is therefore in the final analysis, only an instrumental value, author's italics, not in an intrinsic one. Bonjour accepts, in, in, eh. Bonjour accepts instrumental value, which suggests he is a consequentialist. However, he might confuse being a means with having only instrumental value. And if he does not adopt the consequentialist framework that is right, that is the right, that the right is determined by the good, the acceptance of instrumental value does not necessarily lead him to truth conduciveness. To show that Bonjour is a consequentialist, therefore, it is better to demonstrate that he also accepts truth conduciveness. Berker cites several Bonjour's several of Bonjour's objections to foundationalism and coherentism as evidence for his being a consequentialist. First, in his early objection to foundationalism, Bonjour argues that foundationalists have difficulty in explaining why basic beliefs are justified, for a belief to be epistemically justified requires that there be a reason why it is likely to be true. Second, Bonjour includes the doxastic presumption that my representation of my belief system is approximately correct as part of his early coherentism. Finally, in his discussion about the problems of coherentism, all the problems of coherentism, the input objection, the alternative systems objection, the meta justification objection, are are all are about how an internally coherent system of beliefs is not truth conducive. However, his objection amounts to the claims that foundationalism has difficulty in explaining how basic beliefs are likely to be true and that being coherent is genuinely truth conducive. These objections require only that truth conduciveness be a necessary condition for justification. They cannot demonstrate that Benjour is a consequentialist. That said, I could not find where Bonjour clearly endorses truth conduciveness plus. Perhaps he is indeed a consequentialist, but Berger has not has yet proven it. Certainly, the fact concerning Bonjour alone cannot demonstrate that consequentialism is pervasive in epistemology. Alvin Goldman, 3-3. Alvin Goldman is the father of process reliabilism and a self-proclaimed epistemic consequentialist. So there should be no doubt that Goldman is a consequentialist, or is he? Uh, let me just stop right here real quick. This is why I, this is the, like, heart of my objection, um, 
about how this paper was written. And I should note that it actually really doesn't matter because this is mostly on the rhetoric and the, the content seems fine here. It's that this is like, this is an old argument. See, it's 1986 here, 1997, 2002. This is well over 30, you know, 20, 30 years now of the terms being this way. So it would have been better if the term, if like the author here, just put consequentialist star for what the bad version was and then use consequentialist fine for what the author was calling just the instrumental version that is preferred. Running up against terminological history is fine, but it, it doesn't, uh, no one's like, this person who's been doing this for 30 years is not going to change. And it shouldn't be expected to. You can just put like a little star next to stuff nowadays, and it's okay. Continuing. In his rely to Burker's prime number example, Goldman argues that the counterexample does not work because the belief forming process fails to satisfy the content neutrality constraint. Goldman first proposed the content neutrality constraint in his seminal paper on reliabilism, What is Justified Belief? Though Goldman appears to maintain that reliabilism is sufficient for justification in order to address potential counterexamples like prime number. It is clear that our ordinary thought about process type slices about process types slices them broadly, but I cannot at present give a precise explication of our intuitive principles. One plausible suggestion, though, is that the relevant processes are content neutral. It might be argued, for example, that the process of inferring P whenever the Pope asserts P excuse me, could pose problems for our theory. If the Pope is infallible, this process will be perfectly reliable. Yet we would not regard the belief outputs of this process as justified. The content-neutral restriction would avert this difficulty. If the relevant processes are required to admit as input beliefs or any other states without any content, the aforementioned process will not count, for its input beliefs have a restricted propositional content, specifically, the Pope asserts P. Berker responds that the content neutrality constraint is either implausible or ineffective. It is implausible because many reliable processes that can justify beliefs do not admit the inputs and outputs with, with any content. For example, visual perception would only normally justify only beliefs about visual features of objects. If the constraint requires only that the process emit the inputs or outputs with many different contents, Berker contends that it is ineffective because prime number can easily be modified to satisfy the constraint. Hence, Berker concludes that the content neutrality constraint does not save process reliabilism. While Berker's response is plausible, I think that he misses the big picture, a sign that both sides fail to grasp the nature of epistemic consequentialism. For a consequentialist to use the content neutrality constraint, the constraint must not carry any non-consequentialist element. That is, the reason for a consequentialist to adopt the content neutrality constraint must solely be truth conducive or the fact that the content specificity would make the process less reliable. But that reason doesn't seem correct. In Goldman's original example, the process of inferring P whenever the Pope asserts P, Goldman admits, is perfectly reliable. Why would a consequentialist deny that it can deliver justification? Goldman offers no explanation. As long as the Pope remains infallible, Goldman could not reject content specificity on consequentialist grounds. The content neutrality constraint is more likely to be non-consequentialist. Thus, Goldman should be regarded as instrumentalist. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, this seems reasonable that even in people who espouse the consequentialism, they understand that there's more to it. And so, I mean, it would be very, very idealistic for someone who's been doing this for 30 years to not understand more than 30 years, for them to basically be so idealistic to not think that there's more to it than a very simple sort of a catchphrase thing. So, yeah, it makes sense that this is a, a long-standing position. Right. 3.4. Christopher, Christopher Alstrom Vige and Jeffrey Dunn. I apologize for your name. It's interesting to compare the response of Goldman with that of K A v, Christopher A J A V and Jeffrey Dunn. Unlike Goldman, uh, Alstrom V and Dunn maintain that the process in prime number can indeed provide justification. Whether their defense is correct or not is correct is not the concern here. 
The crucial point is that this reply is genuinely consequentialist. In their more recent paper, they argue that some versions of consequentialism can avoid the trade-off problems, and process reliabilism is one of them. So if Alstrom Vige and Dunn's response is acceptable, it seems that process reliabilism could ditch the content neutrality constraint and remain true to consequentialism. However, this is not true. In their response to other counterexamples, they show that process reliabilism essentially contains non-consequentialist elements. To, to see that, let's examine their responses to counterexample like scientists. Alstrom Vige and Dunn argue that scientists poses no problem to process reliabilism because my belief in God is considered justified in the forward-looking way, but process reliabilism determines the justification of belief in the backwards-looking way, namely in terms of whether the belief is produced by a truth-conducive process. Thus, they conclude that counterexamples like scientists cannot th threaten reliabilism. Burkert does comment that epistemic justification is essentially backward-looking, where whereas consequentialism is forward-looking, so it appears that process reliabilism could avoid Berker's criticism. However, Berker anticipates this response. Considered a, consider a modified version of scientist. Now I form the belief that God exists through the process of forming the belief X whenever forming it will promote true beliefs over false beliefs. Given that the process is truth-conducive, process reliabilism would have to consider my belief justified. To respond to this objection, Alstrom Vigge and Dunn argue that process reliabilism requires that the reliability of a process must be evaluated only in terms of the truth ratio of belief it directly produces. Hence, the truth beliefs that my belief in God promotes must be excluded when the reliability of the process is evaluated. In that case, the process is not reliable, so they think that Berker's objection still fails. So. Yeah, so in some sense, because it's not relevant to the uh, the new beliefs that the belief in God, it was only the belief in God was only required to get the grant, but not to actually get the uh, the more knowledge. And so this is sort of um, direct. This directedness is here. It has to be relative to the uh, knowledge. It has to be directly related. Okay, Alstrom, Vigian, and Dunn deny that their defense is ad hoc, but the issue is whether, well, I'm sure they do. It does, the way this author set it up doesn't make it sound like it's anything but ad hoc. <laughs> but the issue is whether it is consequentialist. Fair enough. Um, in their later paper, Alstrom, Vigian, and Dunn argue that consequentialism doesn't need to consider all consequences. For example, act consequentialism considers only the consequences of the act evaluated, and rule consequentially only consequences of the rule when people comply. So they conclude that it is fine for reliabilism to consider only the consequences directly produced by the process. However, the analogies break down. Rule consequentialism considers only consequences of the rule when people comply because they are what complying the are what complying the rule will or will likely to cause, but it does consider but it does consider all consequences directly and indirectly caused by complying the rule, at least those that could reasonably be reasonably anticipated. True, one may worry that some consequences are so remote or deviated that it's difficult or even wrong to take them into consideration, but any indirectly caused consequence that can be reasonably foreseen should be considered. This is what happens in scientists. The scientific discoveries that my belief in God will promote are reasonably foreseeable. It's puzzling why any consequentialism would disregard them. So they're positing the ad hoc condition is more likely to be driven by non-consequentialist concerns. What is wanting in their defense is, is an account of why the exclusion of indirectly caused consequences can enhance the truth conduciveness. Without such an account, and I can't think of any, we should maintain that process reliabilism is instrumentalist. In conclusion, epist actually, I think this argument is good. Just want to note that right there. This was uh, this is showing how the ad hoc uh, condition is actually a problem in terms of the uh, not non-consequentialist concerns this was a uh, well argued okay that's all in conclusion epistemic consequentialism is not pervasive it is true that many epistemologists consider themselves consequentialists when examining their views more closely i showed that they are epistemic instrumentalists who maintain that truth conduciveness is merely a necessary condition of justification by st distinguishing between instrumentalism and consequentialism I also identify the structural problem of consequentialism, that is, the thesis that truth conduciveness is sufficient for justification. Okay, nice paper. I uh, think it 
it was actually very well done. I mean, my main gripe was um, with the argumentation here, um, which is really okay, because, like I was saying not too long ago, no, these people have been calling themselves consequences for a very long time, and so they're not going to give that up. All the literature is that way. It's an entrenched concept. They're not going to change your name now, and not for this paper. I mean, this paper is good, but it's not that good that everyone's going to be like, oh, throw our hands up, let's all change our uh, everything in the last 30 years on this topic. Um, so, I mean, that's a minor gripe in how this was argued for. It's it's good because it made everything clear. Um, I'm sure that there's other ways to do that, of course. You could have just called this, like, consequentialism, like, instrumentalist consequentialism or something. Um, just so one more line of just making it a... calling it a shorthand and not saying that this is a bad term would have been... Like, if I was a reviewer, I would have just said, hey, look, just throwing a line towards the top and saying, I'm going to call it instrumentalism. I still mean consequentialism, but I'm going to call it instrumentalism for the course of this paper. Um, that's all. So, I mean, that that's all it would have taken. Um, you're still getting accepted if I was your reviewer. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's see. Anything else to say about this? Um, yeah, so I didn't like the argumentation overall was quite good. Um, very clear because the simple use of the what's it called the, this uh, right here this, this right at the beginning they show necessary and sufficient condition and they were, they're breaking it down between just being a necessary condition and being a necessary and sufficient condition and then they showed that throughout basically in an argument here and then they went and did some examples in of um like some of the bigger, I guess, I, I don't know all this literature, but some of the known people in this area. And so that way people could understand that it, what they are saying plays nice with how people already are talking about stuff. Grateful reviewer. Oh, okay, so the reviewer caught a better uh, quote than the author had. That's nice. Um, anything else to say here? Yeah, this seems kind of fun. I didn't know this, uh, I don't know this literature, so it's kind of an interesting thing to have the sort of, uh, the sort of the meta structure from ethics applied to epistemology. Uh, so, so you have like a deontic epistemology, you got a consequentialist one. Like I said, I've heard of the, uh, well, I've heard of like people trying to do a virtue epistemology. I just the use of the concepts as like an analysis uh, tool is sort of interesting. Um, that you can sort of apply the consequentialist and deontic sort of overarching theory as a way to look at the structure of the epistemic theories is uh, eh, it's kind of clever. So eh, okay, that's a, that's it for this paper. Um, I may stick around. So if anyone's watching, uh ask your question now but I'm going to I'm going to get some more water and I'll be right back for another paper. So, thank you for watching.